next week's uh, webinar, part two, three more big diversity related questions resulting from COVID-19. As you all know, this is a uh, important and challenging time for all of us in higher education. And uh, one of the points of this uh, particular session is to make sure that issues of diversity and equity uh, are not forgotten and the rush to go online. And today we're covering three important topics and I want to uh, share them with you uh, right now. First of all, we're looking at uh, what is the impact on instructional design equity and assessment as we look at what's happening today. Secondarily, what should diversity professionals do to seize the moment that we are in? And lastly, what does the new normal look like? Uh, I want to uh, quickly introduce our outstanding panel uh, that we have assembled. First, Leanne Whelan, instructional designer, faculty development lead, Center for Transformative Learning at Forsyth Technical Community College. Leanne, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Uh, also, we have Dr. Sean Huddleston, president of Martin University. We thank you so much, Sean, for taking some time to be with us today. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Dr. William T. Lewis, Sr., co-founder of Kuglu. And we here at Diverse Issues in Higher Education are grateful uh, for this opportunity to be in partnership with Kuglu on uh, this important webinar series. And the first question I'd like to pose is to Lou. Um, one of our key questions is, um, what should diversity professionals do to seize this moment? Uh, what are the opportunities around issues of diversity? What are the pitfalls? Uh, and I wanna uh, pose that question, first of all, to you, Lou. What should professionals in a DEI space do to seize this moment? Let me let me first say thank you, David, uh, for this opportunity. Thank Diverse for their partnership. I would like also to like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Sean Huddleston and also uh, Ms. Leanne Whelan for, for joining us today. And to the listening audience, I want to thank you uh, for being a part of this, this conversation as well, which is a very important conversation. As it relates to your, your question, let me first just share with you this, this story. Uh, we, 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 last week, we talked about the anxiety of how faculty and students uh, are experiencing around going online and, and doing their, their work virtually. Well, I had a class this past Tuesday, and I didn't hold my class through Blackboard Collaborate. I held it through Go, Go to Meeting, one of the, the platforms that I'm familiar with. And midway through the class, as I was talking about the updated syllabus, my internet connection went out. And I'm up there, now my heart is beating fast. My, my students, they're, they're, they're there, but I can't see them. The internet falls out. And now I, I'm, I call my wife, hey, hey, love, the internet is out. What's going on? And I'm up there just kind of struggling right now. I try to put on the hotspot on my phone and the hotspot wouldn't, wouldn't get together. And so eventually the internet did come back on. And to my surprise, my students were there waiting for me uh, to return. And so I was excited about that because I know doing a traditional college setting 20 years ago, five minute rule, if you late five minutes, I'm out the door. <laughs> so, the, so the students stayed and so that was, that was quite interesting. So this whole notion around having anxiety, we all will have it, but we will all get through. We just take a breath and just keep it moving. But to answer your question very directly as it relates to what uh, chief diversity officers and diversity professionals should be doing right now in order to seize this, mo seize this moment, I believe in this moment, this is a time for us to take a pause, take a pause and do some deep thinking around what equity really means and do some think and do some deep thinking around strategically engaging with our colleagues in our Center for Transformative Learning efforts or our Center for Learning and Teaching engaging with our college in institutional research engaging with our college our colleagues who are are doing this work on the front end and on the front lines that allows us the opportunity to be in the conversation we cannot be on the sidelines of the conversation so this is the time for us to seize the moment because everybody's listening everybody's ears are attentive to how do we do this so everybody's looking for questions so as a diversity professional you're in a prime place 
to be a solution to the, to the, to the problems that we're all experiencing right now. That would be one of my biggest challenges to our colleagues by seizing that moment, being strategic, and being in that conversation. Sean, I saw you nodding your head. It sounded as if um, there were a couple of points that Lou made uh, that you might endorse. Uh, what should we be doing in the DEI space, Sean, at this time, do you think? Yeah, sure. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and uh, to everyone uh, on the webinar who's under the sound of my voice. I pray that you are all safe and healthy and I, I pray your families are as well. These are indeed uh, very uh, interesting times for us as we find our way to this new normal and uh, certainly hope and pray that you are all uh, well uh, and uh, progressing through this. Uh, you know, Will made some phenomenal points there. Um, it does give a different spin on what equity is, and it gives us uh, a different spin on what the institution's commitment to equity needs to be. There are, as we well know, that um, there's diversity in diversity. And so we've got to be uh, very focused in on um, how we address uh, the individual cultural needs and, and dynamics, but also the intercultural needs. Um, we need to make sure that if we have put in place uh, the opportunity to have employee resource groups or affinity groups, that we're still <clears throat> encouraging those connections to occur, even in a virtual environment. We've got to make sure that the student support services that we provide rise to the inequities that exist on our campuses on a regular basis, and we're doing that uh, in supporting those students in a virtual way. And so, in addition to that, um, as I shared uh, earlier with a few people, uh, this uh, new pathway or new normal is entirely unchartered territory for diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals. We've never had to do this work in a virtual space. So how do we create inclusive excellence virtually? How do we make sure um, that access and equity exists in, exist in a virtual space? And that takes certainly some deep thinking, but also um, a practitioner's levels uh, focus in, in doing that. Thank you so much. And uh, Leanne, um, so many educators at this time are wondering what should we do? How should we do this when it comes to instructional design? We started the semester in class. I had no plans um, come finals time to go online, you know, um, there's a scramble right now to try to convert on the fly um, instructional design that was not meant for online. And so, uh, Leanne, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact of this COVID-19 crisis on instructional design, equity, and assessment as we are about to get into finals and people are just trying to get it right but don't know where really to turn. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience and maybe some advice you might have for, for our audience. Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's, it's funny. There's a lot of terms that have been floating around right now. Um, things like teaching triage, pandemic pedagogy, crisis schooling, right? These are the sort of terms that um, are hitting my inbox and that are happening in conversations with my faculty where I work. Um, but I do want to sort of give the encouragement that just because this is an exceptional situation, it doesn't mean that overnight you are expected to become an exceptional online teacher. Um, that's not the expectation for the remainder of the school year, right? And so the thing that I keep trying to work with my faculty on is not to do it all or to carry on with your syllabus the way you wrote it that's okay, it's done. Um, you know, you, the, the expectation is not for you to complete the semester the way you thought you were going to. Um, instead, it's actually to do something a little simpler, and it's to start thinking of your course actually from a backward design perspective, and to say, well, what is my learning outcome, my ultimate learning outcomes for this class. You have to write them in your syllabus, so you've got them. Um, you know, they're usually four or five key things that you want your students to walk away with, right? And so it's focusing on those things and saying, how can I assess those in this current climate? If that means some content has to fall to the side, 
that's okay. If that means that an activity that I really love, I don't have time for it, that's okay. It's really looking at your learning outcomes and saying, what is the direct assessment I can use to address this specific course outcome most effectively? Um, another thing that we're really seeing um, as being very effective is using this as a time for assignment revision as a method of assessment, which is um, something I would encourage. So for example, if you're teaching a political science course or an English class um, and your students have written a paper recently, don't give them the next two papers, right? Instead, have them work on the thing they just did for you in a revision and expansion format. So perhaps they add to it using the new terms or skills or ideas you want them to incorporate. Right? That's a way to have them show you they know what reflection is, show you they know what revision is while still practicing a new skill. Right? And again, that's as simple as focus on the learning outcomes, draw direct assessment connections um, in a way that fits a pre-existing assignment or a pre-existing structure. So in a funny way, we're asking you to do less, but in another way, it's actually a little bit more rigorous. Thank you so much, Leanne. And there's so much talk these days about the new normal. What is the new normal? Um, in the K through 12 space, those of us who have kids, the dates keep moving. They're gonna be out two weeks, they're gonna be out four weeks, they're gonna be out for the rest of the school year. And what's gonna happen in August? In the higher ed space, um, lots of talk about the new normal. We know that the rest of the term is going to be uh, online, um, but are we going to be out of this uh, come August when it's time for everybody to go back to school? Or is the new normal going to look something like what we're doing right now? And, and that prospect is concerning for a lot of people because they feel unprepared and underprepared. So, Sean, I was wondering if you could address this issue of the new normal. Um, what kind of preparation? is happening uh, at your institution for the new normal and what has been your communication uh, with faculty, staff, and students about what is this new normal that we're dealing with? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so just a little context about Martin University. So we're Indiana's only predominantly Black institution. Uh, we largely uh, serve an adult, working adult student population. Uh, about 90% of our students attend on a part-time basis, and because they're working during the day, most of our courses uh, happen in the evening. Uh, we're a open admission institution. Uh, we always have been, and many of our students come to Martin University um, not taking the traditional path to college. In some cases, we have students who didn't complete high school who go and complete high school equivalently and then just move right into Martin University. I, I give that context to say that we were primarily a face-to-face -face institution. Uh, our graduate programs were growing and we were seeing more demand uh, to move into virtual uh, and online classes. And so that work began, but, I, but we recognized that one of the things that is most beneficial for working adult students is to have flexibility in uh, uh, modalities and course delivery methods. And so we were moving into the direction of uh, hybrid courses and online classes and eventually programs. This certainly accelerated that. What I think will happen uh, in this new normal, I think we're gonna see uh, even more of that. I think you're gonna see just an influx of different resources and tools that are gonna be developed, that are being developed right now, quite frankly, to be able to assist uh, institutions with making that migration or that transition to hybrid and online. I think that's gonna continue. I think technology uh, being continued to build, be, uh, being continuing to be a part of how we deliver uh, teaching and learning is going to remain. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have, find, have to find ways to be able to provide student support services virtually as well. And I think that's probably gonna be within that new normal, uh, being able to connect uh, students to those services, uh, but also operationally, making sure that uh, in the event that things occur, that institutions don't shut down 
because they're not able to operate in a virtual environment. Uh, I'm on calls every day with presidents across the country and with educational associations around the country. Uh, and everybody is facing financial challenges uh, because of the disruptions that this causes. And even with stimulus funding uh, potentially coming forward, whenever that might be, and other sources of funding coming available, um, being able to really kind of stop uh, some of the issues that are happening with uh, the below uh, expected uh, revenue that's coming in is it, quite challenging. And so uh, that new normal will include ways to be able to uh, help to move uh, institutions and operations forward, but in a virtual way is, is what I believe. In the end, uh, I saw you uh, nodding your head because I, I can only imagine that on a daily basis, uh, you're confronted with questions on what is the new normal and having to plan around this new normal. Um, the prospect that we may be online longer than expected. In fact, even if things go back to quote unquote normal uh, in the summer, um, given what the experts are saying about the potential recurrence of COVID, um, we may be right back, you know, in terms of no face-to-face -face instruction come the fall. And so I was wondering, Elaine, if you could talk about this concept of the new normal, questions that you're fielding and plans that you're making. So right now, what we're encouraging our faculty to do is to, to do kind of what I was saying just a second ago. First of all, just get through, right? Just sort of um, help your students as best you can to close out this semester um, successfully. But be thinking about the work of building your class into some kind of virtual format for fall, um, specifically with a kind of hybrid or blended course design. So if you do that, the beauty of it is if we go back in August and we're face to face and we feel good, you can continue on. And actually, truly, the best courses that I've been in face to face actually have a pretty robust online presence as well. We know that best practice says just because you deliver a beautiful PowerPoint in class um, and your students are really engaged, that shouldn't be the only time they're allowed to access that material, right? They should be able to encounter what they're learning face to face constantly through a digital platform, through the learning management system. They should be having opportunities to kind of touch the content outside of your classroom. So hybrid's a good idea no matter what. Um, you haven't lost anything by building a hybrid course if you're in a face-to-face -face setting. Having a hybrid design though, if you do have to push to online, is much easier to scale up. Right? It's much more difficult to go from face-to-face -to, -face to online, as so many instructors are finding right now. But if you build and design a course as a hybrid, if you're running face-to-face, -face, no problem. If you've got to scale up to online, it's a much quicker jump. Um, so that's what we're doing in our department right now, um, is meeting with instructors and going ahead and getting that process started. The other, and I would say more important thing it's allowing us to do is go ahead and start addressing issues of access, both for our faculty members, especially our adjuncts, and then also our student population. If you go ahead and plan now, you can start to end around a lot of the things you're having to crisis manage in this current moment, and they won't be crisis moments come August. And Will, do you have a word um, about this concept of a new normal. Uh, obviously, if we look at what's happening in terms of the advice of government, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of where we're going to be uh, come the summer um, when it comes to bridge programs, right? Bridge programs that are so critical uh, for first generation students, for the underrepresented. Um, is that even going to happen? You know, are we going to lose? Uh, a lot of underprivileged students amid this rush to go online, amid this uncertainty. Um, how will do you believe this new normal uh, can account for the challenges of the underprivileged uh, as they even look at this uh, higher education space? That's a very great question. I, I, and it, the, and this, the challenge is real. I mean, when we think about when I was at, I, several years ago, when I was at Indiana University, 
I had the opportunity to run a bridge program, uh, to run a, a pre-college program to bring the students from the Indianapolis area to IU Bloomington to experience that campus life, to live in the dorms, to eat at the cafeteria. Now, if, we, if we're not able to do that, that's a, that's a missing opportunity. That's a piece of that, that experience that those students who would otherwise participate in those bridge programs would not have. So therefore, what we have to do is now, in my opinion, is always continue to think about creating relationships. Social distancing does not mean social isolation. And so we have to now think very critically and innovatively in terms of how, by using the online and the virtual environment to create community for those most vulnerable populations. Uh, and the moment that we create those, those communities, we give, we give our students a virtual tour, perhaps, and this is the idea, I don't know if, it's, if it'll work because we don't, we've not been there before, but what if we had a, a tour guide who was on campus with, with a camera, walking around camera, showing different aspects of the campus to our uh, students who otherwise wouldn't be able to join us on campus because everybody's on, at, at home working virtually, right? And so I think that we have to think about the, the uh, action and our responses in those very critical ways. But yes, to answer your question, there will be uh, a, a churn of our students uh, in our most vulnerable populations. And what we have to do from a practitioner standpoint is to make sure that we're creating uh, in, uh, belonging and community virtually. And Shaw, you mentioned that at your institution, uh, you're serving uh, a lot of uh, students uh, who um, may be from uh, underprivileged backgrounds, you know, who, um, you know, are coming to your institution um, looking for this uh, way out, this way up. Um, but obviously, this crisis um, has put a wrench uh, in plans, right, it has put a barrier on families who are looking at their finances and saying, no, there's no way um, that we're gonna be able to do this. Um, when it comes to these kind of issues, um, what is your communication uh, when it comes to serving these uh, most vulnerable populations? Sure, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so one of the first things we did when we knew that we were going online, so every student that comes to our university, we try to make sure that they get technology in hand when they walk in the door. So we give them a laptop, uh, we give them connectivity, uh, and we make connectivity available while they're on campus. But we didn't know uh, what might be happening uh, at home. And so uh, we, we, we had a communication plan that was largely focused on getting emails and video messages and other things out to students, but then it occurred to us that what if they don't have uh, ability to connect at home? And so we connected with uh, local service providers and found out what, to find out what uh, they have available. And we were quite surprised that uh, Comcast and Sprint and others uh, were helping with this problem. And so we made those resources available to our students. The next thing that we wanted to do is to make sure that they had uh, the information that they needed. So we picked up the phone. We divvied it up amongst all of our employees. We picked up the phone and called every single employee, I mean, every single student, and we checked on them. We found out if they were having connectivity issues, but we also want to know how things were in general. Um, are you, is, is everything okay? Do you, do you feel secure? Um, you know, how, how everything from, are, are you okay with food and, and, uh, and, and shelter and things like that? Um, how are your kids doing? How are you, you know, kind of dealing with all of this mentally, mental health wise, how are things going? And we were able to find out uh, what we needed to do to provide uh, the services and support. So we found out we had some students who were dealing with some food insecurity. So we reached out to a couple of local organizations and we actually staged a food giveaway on our campus so that um, the, the organization came in and they practice all of the uh, safety uh, procedures. Uh, they keep themselves distanced from each other. They use all of the personal protective uh, equipment and they uh, put, uh, they put uh, food bag bags together and then students could come through the parking lot and just pop their trunks. And we were just, we had people just give, putting it, uh, the food in there, but you know, we wanted to make sure that that was available to them. Uh, and we uh, guided them to other resources as well. Uh, because one big concern that we found was that we had not been, had not 
we weren't in this, this environment of online, students were worried about if they could be successful. So the calls helped to reassure them. Uh, but secondly, to find out, are there going to be other barriers that might prevent them from being able to continue with their education? So that's kind of what we've done to ensure uh, that success uh, or try to help with the success of our students. Leanne, um, I'm actually wanting to uh, jump to some of the questions that came um, in advance of this webinar and even questions we didn't get to last week and a couple of the questions surrounding the issue, surrounding the issue of grading. Uh, we know that there are a lot of equity issues around assessment, around grading, making sure that all students um, are assessed properly and accurately. And so we know that there are some institutions now considering uh, moving to a pass-fail uh, situation, uh, given what's happening with this uh, pandemic. And one of the questions that came in is uh, what advice that you might have for institutions that are considering just moving to pass-fail um, in response to what's happening in terms of sending students online. And of course, the question, of course, uh, feeds into the issue of how pass fail will affect GPA students requiring GPA um, level of a certain type to maintain their scholarships and um, what discussions are you having and are you seeing um, being had around pass fail being implemented in a way that's equitable and, and fair to students? Yeah, so I mean, I will be speaking less from an administrative perspective and more from a faculty and faculty development perspective, but um, I work at a community college and the sort of vast number of our students are non-traditional learners, they're adult learners, they're returning from the workforce. We have a huge number of economic workforce development programs, which are actually not curriculum courses, they're certification based. So for example, our electric lineman program um, is not sort of an ABCD course, it's can you wire it, can you not wire it? Um, and so in, in some respects, like that is its own set of challenges to how do you do assessment on technical trades when students aren't allowed into these lab spaces. Um, but for our curriculum classes, one discussion that's happening right now, um, because we are 90% Pell Grant, um, is it shouldn't be a choice that students get to make in exclusion. So in other words, there has to be an advisor, a mentor, a department chair, a program coordinator, someone that knows this student's academic trajectory and their ultimate graduation goals needs to be in contact with them about their pass fail options and to sit down with them and to counsel them on what makes sense for them. Especially if they are a Pell Grant recipient, which most of our students are, how does that impact financial aid? How does that impact timing, right? Because we know that timing is a big part of financial aid. If you're going to pass fail this course, how does that affect the prerequisites that you have coming later? Um, and it, of course, depends on which field of study because our health tech um, requirements are so different from something, you know, like an associates in arts. So for example, if I have a student that's on a nursing pathway, he or she um, may not realize that they probably shouldn't take a pass fail on a class because they have to have a certain GPA requirement in order to be able to continue in the nursing program. And if you want to get done in two years, that's going to set you back a semester and you may not have enough financial aid left, right? So these are very, very complicated questions that students should not be allowed to make in exclusion. Um, they need to have that advisory, um, that advisory component. And so I know just from talking with our Dean's Council that um, they're thinking about mobilizing phone calls, advising, um, you know, not just our advisors because that would overwhelm um, our advising system um, because we're such a big institution. So it's kind of gonna be all hands on deck um, if we really want to make sure that students know when pass fail is going to benefit them and when it's not. Um, I would also say that we are trying to encourage our faculty to keep in mind the fact that assessment in an online environment does advantage certain students. 
And what I mean when I say that is it's much easier for a student that comes from a background that's more white collar and that has more familiarity with technology to be successful in online assessments. If you're an instructor and the student is logging on, participating in synchronous video chats, turning things into the links on time, it's easy in your unconscious bias to want to grade that student higher and to say, oh, that student's performing really well in this tough situation. And what you may not be sort of um, paying proper attention to is the fact that a student that may not have that digital literacy isn't not trying and isn't not doing the work. They may just not be as proficient at the technical part of doing the assessment. So it's kind of um, a backwards way to answer your question, but I think that there's two things we have to keep in mind. Assessment and online naturally carries some, some, some privileges and some unconscious bias, and that pass-fail can't be something that we leave up to the decision of the student on their own unguided, especially when there's um, grant funding involved. And Will, um, interestingly enough, another question that came in was uh, concerning how decisions uh, to make courses uh, synchronous versus asynchronous affect equity and inclusion when you're factoring real life uh, in terms of what's happening with students right now. Uh, students having to babysit while, uh, you know, studying, teachers having kids run in while they're trying to deliver uh, lectures. Um, talk about this issue of synchronous versus asynchronous offerings and, offerings and how of this issue affects the equity uh, concerns that uh, many people have right now. Absolutely. As I stated, I, I had class this past Tuesday, right? And so in, in having class this past Tuesday, not only did I present the class live, but I also recorded the class so that the students could go back and listen into the recordings. And even for those students who were not able to uh, participate during the live experience. They can go back and listen to the recordings. I also think that, uh, and, and Leanne, and we, Leanne and I had a brief conversation about this yesterday in terms of this whole notion around flipped classrooms, right? And so to also address that whole notion is when we begin to say, what is it that we need that we, that we want the students and need the students to learn, let's teach that not necessarily through a lecture, but let's have some exercises that happens outside of that classroom experience, outside of that webinar, if you will. Then once we come into the webinar, we're really having a dialogue about the learning and the reflective practices that have happened in the midst of that, those exercises. So, so I, I believe that when we begin to look at the education from that process and flip it, if you will, that gets us away from that, that synchronous type of modality and begins to look at, at different ways in which we can engage students in the learning process and also different ways in which we can begin to uh, measure their learning as well. If I could just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I would just add that um, another problem with, with synchronous education that we're facing right now is we serve um, not just for Scythe County, but Stokes and Surrey County, which are um, sort of in the Appalachia foothills and are predominantly rural and have some pretty significant internet deserts. And so a lot of our students in that region are having to like get in their cars and drive to mobile hotspots and do the work when they can. They may not even have access to the to a car. They may have to wait until a parent or a guardian or a friend can come and get them, drive them to a mobile hotspot. And then they're literally on their cell phone trying to like upload something to their LMS. Um, and synchronous you know, a synchronous classroom requirement isn't, isn't effective for that student and puts them at a disadvantage. Um, so, you know, those are also things to think through. Um, can you, does that mean you should never have synchronous sessions? No, of course you can, but there's got to be a way for that student that maybe is struggling with questions of access to participate after the fact or participate differently. Um, so it's, it's just kind of, you have to thought experiment every solution and find the holes that may not work for all learners. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, chime in that, you know, in some cases, synchronous sounds like a good idea at the time. 
uh, we, we've asked our faculty and our adjuncts to uh, check in with their, their classes, uh, their, their uh, students on a regular basis uh, to determine if, it's, if the modality is continuing to work. And, and uh, we, we've had a couple of situations where faculty have had to switch to asynchronous because it just was too difficult for the students in the class, especially low enrolled classes. Um, there were times when that was happening. So um, I, I think that you gotta be as flexible as possible and move yeah. to, uh, at the end of the day, um, it has to be about the student and it has to be about an uninterrupted experience in some way or another. And so if you are student centered, um, we got to make sure the students are getting it the best way they can. Hey, well, I, I thought you had a point also about this issue, synchronous, asynchronous. I thought you might have something you wanted to say, Will. What, did you have something? No, no, I, I'm fine with that. I made my point. The other question that came in, uh, and I think I'm going to pose this to Sean, um, is how to deal with faculty not ready to migrate to this remote teaching environment. Faculty who were fine with face-to-face. -face. They grew up saying, this is what I wanna do, that's how they best teach. And so um, they are forced to do this, but you know they had no intention to do so. Have you had any conversations uh, about, around uh, dealing with the fact that many faculty are not ready and do not thrive in this format. And how have you approached that, Sean? I wanted to ask you that question. I'm smiling because I'm wondering if one of my faculty members is the person who sent in uh, uh, that question. Uh, it, it is definitely a, a real issue. Um, you know, as I, I, I shared before, you know, we were in a face-to-face -face format. I mean, that was our primary uh, and really, in some cases, sole way of being able to do our teaching. Um, we employ a number of adjuncts uh, uh, who are, quite frankly, uh, have uh, had retired or had moved away from teaching and they're kind of moving back into the space now. And, um, you know, they, they liked it and they, they like, kind of liked the way that we did things before. Uh, one of the things that was critically important for us as we knew that we were moving into this place um, is to have regular faculty development. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, in addition to uh, having our students and having multiple platforms for, for faculty to be able to choose from, uh, to be able to deliver synchronously uh, and asynchronously, we also have uh, folks on, on the, uh, in our academic leadership who are holding development uh, sessions on a regular basis. In some cases, it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of counseling or consulting. Uh, in other cases, uh, it's uh, broader and more collective. Uh, so we're, we're uh, making sure that our faculty are developing into this space in the same way that our students are developing. I think what was uh, important and has worked well is that we have allowed for multiple platforms. So, you know, uh, from a synchronous perspective, we've got Zoom uh, and we've got uh, Google Meet. Uh, we've got a couple of other things that um, are uh, available to our faculty. So we're actually letting them pick the one that they feel that they might be most comfortable with. Um, and then the async or the, yeah, the asynchronous method can be something as simple as emailing students back and forth. Um, but so we've had to migrate a few in uh, and just like we're saying to our students, you can do this. We're saying the same thing to our faculty as well. And uh, Leanne, another question that came in that um, I think is important and that many faculty may be asking is, you know, what advice might you have about going online but not uh, dummy down academic expectations, right? Not water down uh, the experience uh, for the student, especially when we talk about grading, which we've already discussed. But what about this issue of uh, and concern about potentially dumbing down expectations uh, by going online? Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, I think that everyone understands that kind of in the short term, we're just going to get through it. But in sort of the longer term, if we think about sort of continuing and developing hybrid courses, I would say that it's actually the opposite. <laughs> um, it's actually more rigorous um, to develop a course that can be scaled up or scaled down because you have to be so specific and so targeted in how you're linking your assessments to the activities you're asking them to do. 
and I'll get really specific here. There's no room for busy work in a hybrid course design, none. It has to be so lean and so effective or else what happens is you overwhelm the students with busy work or with work that's very unconnected from what it is you're asking them to be able to do. Um, so I, I, you know, I sort of like to encourage my faculty this is actually a chance to increase rigor and to cut the fat out of your courses to say, you know, great, you've been doing like this group activity, but does it allow them to practice the skill that you really want them to do? Or is it just kind of something you've always done? Right. And if it is something you've always done, you get the luxury of getting it out of there. Right. You don't have to account for it in a digital space anymore. You don't have to account for it at all. Right. It's less work for you. Um, in the same way, you know, don't just say, oh, online, I'll do a discussion board. Well, if you want to grade 300 discussion responses, go for it. Right. But if you sort of take that moment and peel back and say, no, how can I redesign this with rigor in mind? Maybe it's not hey, post your discussion response. Maybe it becomes instead, these two people are gonna swap, do peer evaluation in real time or in recorded time, and then use that as the front part of an assignment that they submit for an assessment, right? And so now instead of grading 300 discussion boards and then another 300 the next week, you're having them refine a discussion between themselves and a peer and include it in a summative assessment so you only have to see it once, but it's already gone through a vision process. Um, it's little things like that where if you start sort of saying, I wanna use this as a chance to apply backward design principles, really strongly link my assessments and my activities to those students will be able to do X, um, you end up with a more rigorous course instead of a less rigorous course. Um, but again, that takes time. Um, you know, that's, that's a job for the summer. That's a job to, to think about working with other people in your department on and, and team teaching and team sharing um, rather than, you know, the next uh, four weeks or whatever it is that's left in the semester. But, um, but that's what I would say. There's, there's so much rigor involved in, in hybrid, good, strong hybrid course design. And, and, and David, this is, this is, this is as well. And I would just like to kind of just not, not touch on the nuances of what Leanne shared, but also, but, but look at the big picture uh, or, or the bigger issue. And the bigger, one of the bigger issues, big picture is, is that there needs to be a shift in mindset. And so, the, the, when we talk about this new normal, this next, this new day, the next horizon, in order for us to get there, we have to shift our mindset. And whatever we did pre-COVID-19, we cannot do post-COVID-19. And so our, mind had, our mindset has to shift in such a way to where now we're being innovative. We're, we're, we're beginning to stretch ourselves to be uh, uh, equity-minded, to be systems th thinkers and also to be innovative thinkers in this new era that we're about to go into. And so the, the old way of thinking, the, the, the old paradigm no longer exists for us. We need to move into the next paradigm. And so that's taking a 30,000 foot level and beginning to say, okay, how do I, if, if student learning is at the core of what I'm here to do, then what's the best way that I can create an atmosphere and create opportunities for students to learn in this new environment. And that may mean I have to throw everything else out the window that I did before and start over. Or at the very least, I have to begin to marry new ideas, new concepts, new ways of bringing forward the learning process to what I've already been doing. And Will, another question for you virtual bias you know one of the questions that came in is how do we deal with virtual bias we know that anonymity um, is something that those already inclined with bias will use um, to be able to uh, really say hurtful and do hurtful things i'm reminded of a story that i wrote uh, about a diversity situation at the University of Oregon. And uh, I saw so many hurtful things and posts and everything else like that. So virtual bias, Will, um, any advice um, concerning how to deal with that 
particular issue? Oh, goodness. Let me tell you, I was on a, a, an event similar to this yesterday. And in, in, in that event, I guess they call it Zoom bombing or, or something of that nature. If I'm mispronouncing, somebody can, can help me out there. But essentially, it was, it was horrible. Uh, it, it was a situation where somebody just took over and flooded the, uh, the meeting with all types of, of derogatory scenes, all types of derogatory uh, messages in the, in the chat function. And so that we're going to continue to see that, unfortunately, until we get to a place to where we can strengthen our technology, secu the security of our technology. What usually happens is, is that the technology uh, outpaces the, the speed of human adaptability. And so we cannot adapt as fast as the technology comes on board. And so as we move to, to, to these virtual spaces, the technology is going to be there. But our processes in terms of monitoring, assessing, uh, to making safe places is going to lag for a moment. Not to say that, that we're not going to get there, but it's going to lag. And so during that lag period, my recommendation is that as uh, sensible and caring individuals, one of the first things we can do is, is whenever we're, we're in that space where we're, we're seeing that, that virtual bias come forward, we do not be complicit and we call it out. Uh, we, we say very, this is, this is not the way that we're doing business. This is not our culture. This, is, this does not represent, for example, for Cytex belonging of, of equity and, and our statement of equity. So whoever is doing this, uh, you, as on the Lord of the Rings, you shall not go forward. This is not it uh, as it relates to how we're moving forward. So I think that is, that's one of the key things is just to call it out. I think secondly, as our IT colleagues become more and more engaged and sophisticated with keeping up with this, we'll begin to uh, look at those, those compliant issues and report them to the appropriate authorities. I was just reading an article the other day, I think it was in Diverse actually, where it talked about hey, the FBI is saying you can begin to report these as, as hate crimes. And so when people begin to realize that it, we're going to look for you, you're going to get caught, and we're going to report this, then that also may stave it out. But I think that I stave it off. But I believe that one of the things that we really need to do is just call it out. When we see it, call it out. Do not be complicit. Uh, do not let it stop us in our tracks, but call it out. And if everybody calls it out, then what that does is, that makes that small percentage go away. They, they, cause if they, if we don't give them the audience, if we don't let them know that we're upset about it, if we say you're not going to stop us, then the only reason they're doing it is cause they want to stop us. Don't let them stop us. Call it out. And also reporting to um to to student code of conduct. So you know, um, Dr. Lewis and I, we have a, a Title IX coordinator who handles all of our student code of conduct. And if anything, any kind of um, ad hominem attack happens in a virtual space or in you know, a physical space, it goes right to Tony. Um, it's, it's mediated immediately. Um, it, it has to go to student conduct the same way we sort of kind of, you know, take plagiarism and cheating and these sorts of things really, really seriously. Um, we're going to have to start ad adapting that kind of stringency to to the virtual space and to the way that students talk to one another um, in a digital environment. Now I want to move to a question that came in from the live uh, Q and A, and this question is with regards to providing online instruction for students with disabilities, uh, in particular deaf and hard of hearing students. And uh, I actually like to pose that to Sean. Um, have you had any experience or advice uh, when it comes to dealing with students who has various types of disabilities that will put them at a disadvantage when it comes to moving in an online environment? You know, it's an interesting question because actually um, disability support services uh, is probably uh, the best equipped of any of the places on campus to be able to address alternate forms of, of teaching uh, and, and learning from, um, you know, uh, what, what uh, we, could, we uh, uh, often see. Uh, with that being said, uh, if an institution has a robust uh, disability support services, uh, then likely um, they should have uh, much of the equipment 
uh, that is needed for students to have that. With that being said, I think you have to make a special reach out to those students who have, a, have requested accommodations and make sure that they have the things uh, that they need to be able to be successful in that environment as well. We have student success coaches at Martin University, for example, uh, and we have some um, who pay uh, special attention uh, to our students who have requested accommodations um, who, or who may uh, uh, need uh, some additional support in some way. Uh, so um, uh, I think that um, hopefully organizations and institutions have been proactive in that approach, uh, but uh, it's it's certainly a student-centered approach. Beyond that, um, it's it's the law. I mean, it's a you have to make sure that you're complying from an ADA perspective as well. So, um, if you don't have uh, a way to be able to continue to support those students in uh, an environment where we're not forced to be uh, teaching and learning virtually, um, then you ought to move real quick to make sure that happens. Another question that came in from the live Q&A is with regards to handling freshmen, handling um, new students uh, coming this fall. Um, what planning uh, is happening? And I'll throw this out to Leanne, but I don't want Sean to follow up for new students, students who uh, have not had any higher education, any experience in online instruction. Their expectation was to go to class, right? Uh, any planning around for these students who we know uh, may be at most disadvantage coming to a space they've never been in, never seen before, and hadn't planned for. Uh, they were looking for class, and we're telling them, of course, that there is really no uh, in-person class possible right now. So how about these new students, uh, Leanne? Any, any planning around uh, how we can help them in this climate? Yeah, so at our institution, I'm sure, it, you know, Sean, you can answer this, um, you know, from an administrative perspective, pretty robustly as well. But, um, you know, I know that for our student success program, we, we have our SOAR, which is our orientation. And so I know that Carrie Blaskowski and the women that are involved in that are, are I mean, they're working double time um, to kind of, to sort of um, restructure and reorganize that because essentially what we're asking is not only, um, hey students, are you, ready to start school we're asking them to sort of have online student readiness as well which used to be its own separate kind of part of our student support right we used to sort of have student readiness and then online student readiness and essentially now those two things are going to be one and the same um, the other thing that we're doing within my department in partnership with student success is having what we're calling socials. So um, reaching out to incoming students. We even have one called, I didn't sign on for this. Like literally meaning I didn't sign on to take an online course. I signed on to take, um, to take a face-to-face -face course. And, and that's essentially like a soft skills um, collaborative environment where they can sort of share fears and share anxieties and get feedback about, well, okay, let's, first of all, let's address sort of questions you have about access. What do you need? Um, can we find, you know, a micro grant to get you the tablet that you need to be successful, right? And then also sort of what are some, um, communication skills you may not have that you need, right? Um, we assume very wrongly that because our students are good with face-to-face -face and verbal communication, that they're gonna be good with written communication. They aren't always confident in that. Um, so it's going ahead and trying to get ahead of some of those things before they even hit August um, so that they feel supported. Um, yeah, that's just one really specific example that we're doing, but I'm sure, Sean, you can speak to the kind of like the sort of administrative aspect of that too. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot of things that keep uh, presidents and administrators up at night these days, and, and enrollment is probably at the top of the list uh, for, for most of us. Um, you know, what, for new students, what we've come to understand is these are students who really haven't had the opportunity to build a lot of relationships uh, in the institution as of yet. Um, most of them haven't even met their, their uh, instructors or their faculty members. Um, they haven't really had a chance to connect with uh, student support services uh, and student success folks that we have, but they have connected with admissions. 
And so we have uh, asked our admissions advisors to stay engaged with new students. Uh, we're going to be hold, holding a virtual new student orientation, uh, but it can't be just a one time event. Uh, it's got to be something that is uh, continues to provide uh, information to our new students um, to continue to orient them to our university, but now orient them to a virtual way of learning. Uh, and so I think that that's really critical. I think that the you know building and extending those relationships and maintaining them is just so so very important. And that way, uh, admissions does a hand off to some of the other. Uh, places in campus where our students will, uh, those new students in particular, will uh, find themselves accessing on a regular basis. With that being said, it's now got us thinking about how we do and conduct orientation. Um, we, we're thinking now that maybe it isn't just a one-time event anymore, but it's a way to treat uh, new students coming in almost as a cohort and making sure that we are uh, continuing feeding them the information that they need, getting them the resources they need, and understanding uh, what challenges they might be having, or even what they're thinking um, as we as we move forward. So um, I, that's uh, how we have uh, certainly chosen, and we're thinking about handling it. Um, the thing that uh, we are still trying to figure out is uh, how we do recruiting uh, in this environment uh, when you can't do the things that you normally do. And so that's uh, with summer coming, uh, and we have a new summer enrollment to, uh, that we're expecting to have. Uh, those are things that we're thinking through right now. Hey, hey, David. Just as it relates to also just a, just another thought. Earlier in our conversation, Sean had mentioned the engagement with, let's say, your your affinity groups uh, on, on on campus. I think one way in to to supplement, uh, to support, and also to enhance uh, our engagement with new students coming on campus is engaging with other populations beyond our office of admissions right so 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 the more that we engage with let's say our affinity groups if we have them or our other student populations our alumni the more that we can engage them in our conversation with engaging new students coming to our university in this new normal the better that relationship is so so now we begin to have a small relationship but we can kind of create an exponential type of experience and relationship with the more populations that we engage with who are, who are connected to our, our college and our universities, then that helps uh, uh, put aside some of the concerns that our new students may have when they come to us uh, uh, in the fall. Last question, the question is for you, Will. Um, diversity and equity inclusion programming. Uh, a lot of institutions doing great work around diversity, not have it just infused um, throughout curriculum and infused in searches, but also have robust diversity programming, uh, be it speakers, be it mentoring. Uh, in a virtual space, Will, uh, what can institutions be doing to continue robust work uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion with regards to programs, series, lectures, speakers, infusing diversity in searches to the extent that they're even going on right now, and also when it comes to uh, administration, uh, programming. Uh, is it possible and how, what does it look like in this space, Will? I would say that this conversation that we're having right now shows that it is possible and, and something that we need to do. And so I would not encourage any, at this point in time, for the diversity professional and those, those offices, keep your foot on the pedal. Uh, this, this is the opportunity for you to really, really show your, your, your value to the institution. And so the degree, and, and, and the degree that you can continue your speaking engagements, move those online, uh, create a, 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 an environment like we have just right here, do a, a Zoom a virtual conference, if you will, uh, do some recordings, uh, place those recordings somewhere in an in a intranet process where students can go and, and download those recordings, download those speeches, do podcasts, uh, begin to get into podcasting, uh, video record your podcast of your speakers so that people can begin to engage and see that material, although it's not in the face-to-face, -face, but it is 
we're still continuing to provide that material and that engagement in that virtual space. Uh, as it relates to uh, the, our, our administration and, and engaging with uh, recruitment and, and the diversity professional diversity officer, now's the time to build, if you haven't done it, build those critical relationships. The work that we need to do is based on influencing different people across the institution in, in critical roles. And how you do that is build the relationships and say, hey, I know that we have a problem and I can be of assistance as we go out and solve this problem. So let me sit down and work with you, join your team. So begin to insert ourselves in places where we may not have been in before this. You know, so one of the questions is, are we a part of the diversity professional, the, the city, are we a part of the crisis management team? Are we a part of the, the inclusive pedagogy team? Are we a part of the, the, are we connecting in with our colleagues in institutional research? Are we connecting in with our, our provosts and our deans as it relates to their hiring process? These are things for sure that we should have been doing before the crisis. But without a doubt, these are things that we need to do going forward in the new normal. Thank you so much, Will. That has to be our last word. We are out of time, but certainly not out of questions. Thank you so much, Sean, Will, Leanne, for taking time out of your busy schedules. Thank you so much, audience, uh, for being with us here today on another episode of Diverse Talk Live. Uh, wishing you the best uh, and safety uh, in this tough time of COVID-19. We'll see you next time. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Great, and thanks again Thank for joining everyone. Uh, once I close the webcast, a survey will come up for you. So we ask if you can please uh, just complete the survey. We'd like to get your feedback on this webcast and get your ideas for future ones. So again, thank you so much for joining. Have a good day.